the context of that chapter we know is talking about discipleship, and it's talking about you know people being fit for the kingdom of God and fit to be the Lord's disciples. And I was thinking about the kingdom. You know, you, when you're part of a kingdom, what kingdoms were about back then, and what a king's job was, was and that, I mean, just read all through the Old Testament, and you see the what the king did was they defended their city. And they went and they conquered other, other kingdoms, if you will. They defended their kingdom and they went and conquered other kingdoms. And that's kind of what it was. And so the Bible has a lot to say about war and, uh, and, and fighting and all that. But we understand that the application Jesus is making about the kingdom of God isn't one where we go out, you know, onward Christian soldiers, but we're not going out with swords and we're not, it's not a physical battle. We understand that. It's not a, a fleshly battle, but it's a spiritual war. Right, but there's a lot of applications that can be made to war. And in this uh, chapter right here, Luke 14, verse 31 is the main part that I wanted to look at where he says, Or, or uh, what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that come against him with 20,000? So, you know, he's got to weigh it out. Can I do that? And we can study the life of David, and we can see a lot of battles that he went into where he only had so many men, and he had, to, he had to face a huge army, and so he had to decide, am I able to do that? And uh, the title of the message tonight is, In Times of Peace, Prepare for War. You ever heard of that, that quote before? In Times of Peace, Prepare for War. And I think that's just a great quote. Some have uh, attributed it to Sun Tzu. Yeah, anybody ever read The Art of War? It's an, it's an ancient book. A, a Chinese warrior wrote this book, and many commanders and, and military experts have studied this work for, for many, many years. And uh, basically, the, it's the art of war. It's talking about how to have this lifestyle of, of, of being in battle and all that. And it sounds like something that would come straight from that book, but it's not. I think it's, it's somebody else uh, that actually quoted that. But it's sound advice in terms of always being ready for war, you know, always being ready. We don't want to be, if we're in a war, you know, we don't want to be caught uh, unprepared for the battle. We go into the battle and we're like, oh, man, that, that, what were we thinking? This was dumb, and we lose all of our men, right? It's kind of the, the concept. And so uh, sometimes, as you see in that text right there, you know, he, he's like, or else, you know, you might have to send – somebody out and negotiate and say, you know what, there's no way we can defeat you. Let's work out some kind of peace agreement <laughs> or whatever. And David actually did that. Just recently I was uh, studying the life of, of David for a series we're doing on Wednesdays in the book of Psalms. And if you go to 1 Samuel 27, 1 Samuel 27, I won't get into... Uh, all the details of the message that I preached yesterday, but David has a, a group of men that are with him. All right, he's fleeing from Saul and all that, and, and he says, Now, I, I, uh, David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more uh, to seek me any more in any coast of Israel, so shall I escape out of his hand. So he goes to this place with his men called Ziklag, and it was basically he was a vassal king there. He was still allowed to be king, still allowed to have his men and to lead his men. In fact, they still went into war, but they battled against mutual enemies, right? So the Philistines had these as their enemies, Israel had these as their enemies, and these are the typically the guys that he fought with, but they went into war conquered all these people and all that but he had decided hey there's no way we can take on Saul right now he didn't even want to fight Saul no way we can take on all the Philistines and so let's work out uh, an agreement with them he counted the cost now I understand that there was other times God gave him the direction and hey it doesn't matter how few you have you look at the life of Gideon with 300 he says I want you to have that small amount of number so that you'll know that I did this I fought the battle for you so sometimes God will give you that advantage but when you don't have that clear leadership from the Lord, all you can do is make the wisest decision that you can, right? And so this concept is, hey, it's not wrong to count the cost. It's not wrong to, uh, to have a plan and to, uh, uh, and to weigh things. 
want to uh, be caught unprepared for battle, but also we don't want to get overconfident after a victory. All right, so here's what happens uh, while David is in Ziklag. Uh, he goes off and he's fighting all these wars, and then he's working for Achish, the king of the Philistines there, king of Gath. And he's working for them, basically. Like I said, he's a vassal king. And so they go off to war, and long story short, they say, hey, you can't fight with us. The people are afraid you're going to turn on us and you're going to help Israel. So he goes back to Ziklag, and when he gets to Ziklag, he finds all of their stuff has been taken, their wives, their children, all been taken captive by the Amalekites. And all their cities been burned and everything. And, and so uh, I believe that's where he writes Psalm 56. And he says, you know, he cries out to God and, he's, and, he, and he seeks God. Right after that, he's, he gets the priest. He says, hey, bring out the ephod. I want to seek God on this and inquire God. He gets right with God. God gives him the victory. And he goes into the Amalekites who just won this battle. Well, it's not really fair since nobody was even there. But they went and they destroyed this city. They took all the... Uh, the, the wives and the children captive, took all the spoils, you know, not just uh, Ziklag, but all the other, there was a lot of other cities that they, uh, that they besieged as well. So they had all this stuff and they were happy. They were, they were enjoying their victory. And look what happens. First Samuel 30, first Samuel 30, verse 16. They end up finding a guy that, uh, an Egyptian that was a servant, to the Amalekites, and he's able to help them to find out uh, where they are. And when he had brought him down, behold, he's talking about the Amalekites here, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. That's a long battle. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, maybe y'all don't appreciate that, but that's a long time to fight, man. Uh, it'll wear you out just fighting somebody just for just three-minute round in a boxing match or a wrestling match or something like that, and, and he's fighting. In fact, now at this point, he's got 600 men. 200 of those men get weary, and they have to go sit out, right? They can't do this anymore, but David keeps pursuing and he fights these guys for all this time from e uh, twilight even until the evening of the next day. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 uh, young men, which rode upon camels and fled. And, and, fled. and so I, I read that and think that he must have said, this must, if, if David only had 600 men and two, 200 of his men had to bail out, and he, and he was fighting them with 400, and he says, none of them escaped except 400 that got away. This must have been a huge army that he was fighting. But the thing is here, this huge army is saying, oh, we got him. We got all of this stuff. You know, we, we have the victory. And they're dancing and they're drinking and they're partying. They're saying, Look at all of our stuff. It's all spread out all over the place. And then he's not ready. And then David comes with his men and he whoops up on him. OK, wouldn't that be embarrassing? Now, that's something that you wouldn't want as a king or leading somebody in battle you wouldn't want to be having this, this being, you know, coming out of one battle saying, hey, we're victorious and just gloating and just enjoying your spoils and all that. And then all of a sudden you're not prepared for another battle. And spiritually speaking, isn't the Christian life just one big war? It's one big warfare. You know, we're just constantly in battle against the devil, constantly in battle against the flesh, constantly in battle against the philosophies and the ways of the world. And uh, this is just the Christian life. Now, it's one a big war with lots and lots of battles, all right? So you come out of one battle, hey, it's just a matter of time before you go into another battle. That's just the way it is. And I'm sure that there's similar sayings in, in different, uh, uh, probably even in the military they have something like this. But I remember uh, when I first started running and I was studying about injuries and stuff like that because sometimes you'd have this injury and you're like, oh, man, it's going to mess me up, right? Well, there's a saying in the running world that's like if you're, you're either injured, recovering from an injury, or getting ready to have an injury. That's just training for running <laughs> in general. I mean, that's just it. But that's not just running. If you're lifting weights, same thing probably. Hey, you got to pull muscle. You got some, because it's work. It's hard work. There's training. There's constant battling. You know, uh, this is the concept. So, so doesn't it make sense? And this is a great philosophy that, look, in times of peace, the war's not over. 
You know, you got a little victory. You got a, a time of peace, you know, relaxation. The war's not over. So, so use that time to prepare for the next battle because it's coming. All right. So the context, of course, like we said, is, is discipleship. And we'll get to that here in uh, a, a little bit. But first, let me just make some quick practical applications. All right. Number one. Here's a similar concept. In times of prosperity, prepare for famine. Okay, in times of prosperity, prepare for famine. Now, uh, different people have different definitions of what it means to be prosperous, of course. But uh, let's just say, basically, you have no need. All right, you're not in some great debt. People aren't knocking on your door asking for money. <laughs> you're not, you know, you have food on the table. You've got the bills are paid. Everything's going good. You feel pretty prosperous. And let me just stop and say, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being able to enjoy the things that you have in this life. Let's look at a few verses. Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18. I, I, I feel like this is consist, consistent within the, with the Bible. There are lots of things in this life you, can enjoy, you could enjoy, but there's nothing better and I think more fulfilling and something that God has given us than to have a family and to enjoy our family. Uh, so the Bible has a lot to say about husbands enjoying their wives, uh, husbands, wives enjoying their children. You know, these are these are wonderful things. Now, if someone's single, they don't have that. Hey, there's a lot you can enjoy, too. But one of the greatest fulfillments is to enjoy family. I think that's one of the best things that God has given us under the sun, as Solomon would say. In this life, you know, outside of spiritual things, best thing we have is our family. You could lose, I could lose my house. I could lose all my money. I mean, I don't even own a house right now. <laughs> it's a church's house, I guess. But, but I could lose everything that I have. But I got my family, and they still love me. Hey, I'm happy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, got, I got my children. I got my wife. You know, even if the rest of my family disowned me or something like that, hey, I'm still happy. That's the greatest gift God could give me, and we should find fulfillment in that. The Bible says, let, the fountain, let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And so uh, there are a lot of verses about that. Look over, if you would, to back up a little bit. Go to Psalm 127, verse 3. Psalm 127, verse 3. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. So you see where, man, having children, what a blessing. Having, uh, you know, your quiver full, so to speak, is uh, that's a blessing. That's something that we should enjoy. And that's not a selfish thing to spend time with your family, spend time with your loved ones. Uh, that's not a bad thing. This is a good thing to do. Look at Ecclesiastes now. Now, we understand that Ecclesiastes is primarily written from Solomon's point of view, being very much in the flesh and talking about things outside of spiritual things, things under heaven, as he says. And, uh, and, and, and so he's talking a lot about how life is is vanity and all the stuff in this life it doesn't doesn't last and so we have to be careful how we read some of the things that he said but here in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9 it says live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity all right in other words outside of spiritual things everything you do in this life that is going to pass away and by the way I hate to say it much as I love my wife and much as I love my family, when we get to heaven, look, it's not going to be the same. You know, we, we tend to think that's going to be, hey, I've got, you know, someone loses their wife, you know, passes away. And they say, oh, I'm going to see him again one day in heaven. I, I'm not saying you're not going to see him again in heaven, but it's not like you're going to be just pick up where everything left off. Jesus makes that actually. But while you're on this earth, enjoy it. <laughs> There's, you should give all. Yes. 
son. It's wrong to enjoy our family. It's not enjoy, uh, wrong to enjoy the fruit of our labor. You know, uh, I enjoy uh, good cooking. Amen? <laughs> I enjoy good cooking. That's not wrong. Now it's wrong. I understand you could go too far and be gluttonous, but I enjoy food. That's not necessarily in and of itself wrong. It's not wrong to enjoy, you know, having a good time, playing some games or whatever. Look, it's not, enjoy, it's not wrong to enjoy fellowship with friends, right? Maybe you're single, maybe you're not married, but you say, but I sure like getting together with friends, maybe feasting with friends like we're going to do here in a little bit. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Enjoy. Hey, Jesus did it. Jesus hung out with friends and feasted. Right now, he was obviously talking on spiritual things. And if you're spiritually minded, you're going to use all situations for spiritual things. But that's another, that's another subject. Not wrong to enjoy some of these things. But can you imagine if I got a wife and I just said, hey, this is great. Let's just go celebrate our love for one another. Let's go on our honeymoon. We went on a honeymoon. Now, that might be the dumbest thing. No, I mean, it's good for spending time with <laughs> I'm about to get in trouble. It's good spending time with, with, your, with your new wife, okay? But the dumbest idea might be, hey, let's go spend every last penny that we've saved up, <laughs> you know, that we have left after the wedding and just throw it all away on just, like, just enjoying this vacation time. Man, you can get to know each other at home, you know? Now, again, it's not wrong to enjoy that. It's not wrong to get away. It's not wrong to have a good time. But I'm just saying, what if I got married and I spent every last penny now I'm gonna. Now we're gonna have hard times. We got no money. We got. <laughs> see what I'm saying? So, part of enjoying what you have now is investing in the future. It might be wise to lay a little bit aside, you know, and uh, and save some uh, some money for another day. We we need to think about these things. It's wrong to uh, to just be wasteful and uh, and spend everything you have. What we're talking about here a little bit has to do with preventative maintenance okay how many of you guys are big on the preventative maintenance i mean you get your oil changed every three thousand miles you make sure your gun's cleaned every time you just super clean and put it even if you don't use it you just take it apart clean it and put it back together i mean you know everything is just like preventative maintenance don't look at me i'm bad at it but <laughs> I do try to, you know, try to keep on, on some things, and I realize that if you don't, eventually you're going to lose it. You know, it's not going to be good. So you can't just say, "Woohoo, I got whatever, I got this victory," and not maintain that and try to think about the future. You know, and so you got to be real careful about that. Changing the uh, oil, changing. You know what I found out? Uh, one of the most frustrating things. When you have a house, or you're living in a house, whether you're renting, whatever the case, is changing the filters and the air conditioner. <laughs> you don't feel if you don't change those things out, man, they get just just dust just all over them, and the next thing you know, the air conditioner's not working, and then, uh, man, it's just it's just annoying. This part of preventative maintenance, you know, this is part of making sure things are going well. And so I know we're talking about human type things right here. This is kind of practical uh, uh, application, but our families, they have got to be prepared for hard times. Look, I enjoy spending uh, leisure time. You know, I get off work or whatever. I go sit down with my family. I enjoy that. We can talk, eat together, do different things. Might play a game or something like that. Uh, a lot of times I'm doing my own thing in the other room while they're playing the games. But we're still together as a family. <laughs> but, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. But you know what? You have to also teach family that sometimes you don't have this luxury. Sometimes you got to be able to do without. Sometimes you got to be, able, and you got to be able to uh, have joy in hard times, right? Not all life is just going to be fun and easy all the time, and so we got to remember that. We got to remember that we can't just uh, spend all of our money. You know, we actually have to go work, and so that we have more money, so that we can do this again. <laughs> you know, you enjoy feasting with your friends. Well, guess what? You got to have money to buy the food so that you can feast. And so you got to go out and you got to work and you got to do all this. Just not, it's just unending. And just like everything in life is that way. You know, I said, you know, that life, spiritually speaking, is just one big war with lots of battles. If you think about it, life is that same way. You know, everything in life is, requires maintenance. You know, ladies will tell you, you can't just do dishes one time and never have to do them again. Nope, next meal, dishes again. 
do laundry, and guess what? Next day, laundry again. I don't know how many times I've heard, I just got all the laundry done. Where did all this come from, right? Because that's life, man. That's the, no matter what you do. Grass, man, just got the grass. Man, it looks great. It's edged. Perfect. I'm going to sit back and relax. Never have to do that again. Yeah, right. Three days back. <laughs> this is life, all right? So we're talking about preventative maintenance. In times of peace, prepare for war. Number two, in times of leisure, this kind of goes hand in hand, but in times of leisure, prepare for hard work. Now, I was just saying that we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to just waste stuff. Don't, don't you, don't you, does wasting bother any, does it bother anybody? Like when somebody just wastes, you know, here's something, it's just me, it doesn't hardly cost anything, but every parent knows this, you know, when everybody's drinking water bottles, in this work, a lot of times you'll see a bunch of water bottles, whose are those? I don't know, all this water you know, we're going to throw it away. No, we're not. We're going to use it to water a plant. We're going to use it to make some coffee. We're going to do something with that water because I hate wasting. I'm like, oh, it's just water. Just dump it out. I hate that, man. I was working one time. I worked at this place in uh, in Springfield, and it was a real clean environment. It, we were, it was a, we made circuit boards, all right, and all I had to do is set the machine up, keep everything clean, uh, check the drills, make sure they got the right drills in there, press a button, and depending on how long the job ran, it just sit there and wait till the job's done. I mean, it was a really nice job <laughs> in a way. In some ways, it was terrible because it was so boring. But we had to make sure everything was clean. It stayed 70 degrees. You know, you had to clean your machines all the time, mop the floors. Really clean environment. And I remember one day, this lady came in, and it was, we just got back from lunch, and, and she had a, a hamburger. And she's walking with this hamburger, and she accidentally drops it. She's right over by my station right there, and she accidentally drops it, and it falls. Just that whole hamburger just falls, boom, just lands on bun, top bun's on the bottom now, bottom bun's on the top, and she says, oh, man, well, that was a waste, and she picks it up, and she throws it in the trash, and I was like, oh. <laughs> I don't think I, d I dug it out of the trash can, but I said, well, all you had to do is take that top bun off if you didn't want to eat it. I would have eaten the top bun, too, but, you know, that was such a waste. I don't know. That's just kind of how it feels with me. And really, like, I hate, I hate seeing food get thrown away. And so, like, I mean, that's part of this problem right here. Because after I'm done with my food, you know, my, my kids, not so much anymore. Because they're, they're pretty much, uh, they're now, like, the ones that eat the leftovers. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, I would eat my food. And then they'd be like, oh, I'm done with this. Do you want it, Dad? Well, sure. Am I going to waste it? You know, and I'd eat it. You're done with this? You want mine too? Next thing you know, man, I got this huge, because I hate wasting, right? Well, here's another thing. Look at Proverbs 18, verse 9. Proverbs 18, verse 9. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. So it's kind of like two sides of the same coin. I mean, you got one person, maybe they make plenty of money, you know, but then they just buy stuff and they just waste it, no big deal. Then you got this other person here, boy, I don't waste anything. Of course, I don't make anything because I'm lazy and I don't have a job or something like that. You understand the, the concept. You got the slothful person, brother to the, to the great waster, all right? And so we don't want to uh, get to the point where we become Oh, all we want to do is enjoy our leisure time, uh, you know, become lazy. Look at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 11. <clears throat> or actually, let's back up. Uh, verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways, and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler provideth her meat in the summer, and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou, ari thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little slumber, uh, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. And so, you see, the Bible actually has a lot to say about, you know, I love how the, I love the animals that he uses. You're slothful. You ever seen a sloth? <laughs> I 
I mean, that thing just walks so slow. I've seen a video where somebody had a, I don't know where they were, but there was a sloth crossing the road, and so they had to stop and wait for the sloth. And they waited, they waited, they waited. Finally, they got out of their car, they went, and they picked the sloth up and they moved it up so they can get back in their car and go. Sloths are slow. Another one would be sluggish. You ever seen a slug move really, really slow? Hey, we don't want to be like that. We don't want to get lazy. We don't want to get, you know, we want to work. We want to be able to provide and store things up. Look, this is just practical uh, wisdom here. But third, let me uh, jump into this now, get a little more spiritual. In times of religious liberties, we need to prepare for persecution. In times of religious liberties, we need to prepare for per- persecution. Now, for the most part, for the most part, I'm pretty happy to be an American. Amen? Anybody else agree with me on that? For the most part, I'm pretty happy to have the freedoms that we have in America. I, I just read not too long ago, you know, we can get caught up in the news and the scare, fear mongering and stuff like that. And we could say like, oh, man, they're going to force everybody to take the vaccine and all that. And look, hey, I'll get to this in a second, but we know where all that's going. All right. We read the Bible. We understand where some of that's going. Uh, but I just read a report that said that that number of how many Americans are saying that they'll get the, the, vac- the coronavirus vaccine or whatever, uh, the number has gone down to like 40%. Right, about forty percent that are actually saying like we'll get that no matter no no matter what you know as soon as it comes out we're getting it. The other sixty percent are like forget that <laughs> you know, and I, I mean to me that just shows uh, shows the mindset of the USA. And sometimes I read and look I'm, I'm not one to just like I don't think we should be. In fact, the Bible talks about the end times. This is a bad thing where people would just despise. Uh, governments and they don't want anyone telling them what to do. They won't want any authority authority in their life. That's a bad trait to just have. But I look at this sometimes in in America and the freedoms that we have, and I say, you know, there's so many people that are like, people don't just put on the stupid mask, for instance. This is just, I'm just throwing this out. I don't see why they just don't put on the stupid mask, stop complaining. Look, if everybody would just do what the government tells us to do, we would all just be safe and happy. We wouldn't have all this problem, right? Well, welcome to the USA. <laughs> because the USA says, no, I'll, I'll decide for myself what's in my best interest. I'm not going to let a person, you know, somebody who claims to be the expert, claims to be the authority, tell me what I must do in order to be safe. I bet you people at one time in history in Germany sat around and said, well, if we just all do what... Uh, how Hitler, you know, if we just all do what he tells us to do, we'd all be safe. Quit fighting against it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In America, we say, no, I want the, I like having the freedom to think for myself and to make my own decisions. Thankfully, we have some rights to be able to stand up for ourselves and all that kind of stuff. Look, I like being uh, an American. And the reality is we only have freedoms and liberties so long as we use those. Freedom. We exercise those freedoms and liberties, okay? The moment that we start just letting them go, right, we just lose them. You guys, the history, history tells you that, and you understand uh, just the, uh, the practicality of that. So, but we know that this is the way that the world is going to go. Christians particularly. Now, I'm not, say, I'm not comparing to the current state of events and saying that Christians are being persecuted, although I know some people, I guess, uh, are, are threatening to be uh, locked up or whatever for having services. Uh, just heard about that. I, don't even, I haven't kept up on I don't know much about MacArthur, I guess, is the new. Has anyone heard anything about that? John MacArthur, I know we don't agree with him on a lot, but have you heard that he's, like, battling this right now? They're threatening to, like, uh, throw him in jail or something like that if he meets or something. I don't It's probably dramatized a little bit. But here, here's what my point is. I don't really think at this point Christians are really being that persecuted. Right, but you hear constantly people talking about where this is going, and and I just started a series on the, on Revelation, and we're going to discuss some of these things at some point. But go to Matthew chapter twenty-four. Matthew twenty-four. At for the most part, look, even, I mean, we just we had uh, this. I'm just don't. I'm not hung up on the mask thing, okay? But just hear me out. Even when we live in a place where pretty much everybody is under a mandate, okay, saying it's mandatory, 
a mask when you go into these places. Now, I can't speak for all places, but I know that in Iola, Chanute, most places that we went to go to, most places except for the place that we went to go eat, people just walk right in, and nobody tells them, hey, you got to put a mask on, right? That's just, that's just what, I'm, what I'm saying is, like, we're not at a point right now where they're holding guns to your head and saying, hey, you better receive a mark of the beast, <laughs> okay? You understand? We're not there. But we understand that even though we're living in peace right now, we know what the Bible says, and we know that the time's coming where we don't, we're not going to have peace. That's just, that's just, in every, look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And, he, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answering, answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye, not, ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence. All right, that's what we got going on right now. I'm not saying that this is the fulfillment of this. We know, hey, if it's bad now, and we understand it's going to get worse, right? Well, then don't just say, hey, peace, peace. You know, everybody, just be comfortable. The government's got our back, everything. No, we as Christians understand it's going to get far worse, all right? And I'm not saying war, live in fear. In fact, I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying just prepare yourself for the fact that the day is coming when our religious freedoms are all right? It's just coming. I'm not saying make a big deal about it or get super scared about it or whatever, but that's just the way that it is. I don't care who you put in the office, who you vote for, or, you know, how much you can change uh, certain things, eventually this is coming. He's, here's what it says. The uh, pestilence, the earthquakes in diverse places, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax. It shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Look, just keep your head up. You're a child of God. He's going to get you through. He's going to take care of you. But don't be surprised when things get worse. You say, oh, no, I've been enjoying our, our, our freedom. I mean, this is the way some Christians act right now. It's like, I've been enjoying our freedom since we got rid of Obama. Everything has just been just like roses since we got Trump in office, right? And they're, I'm serious. They're still talking like that's true. It's just been just peaches and cream since Trump got in office, right? I'm so glad we got uh, Obama out, right? And now, the, look, look, if you get Biden, then the world's coming to an end. The world's coming to an end. <laughs> Enjoy your peace while you got it, but I don't care who's in office. I don't care what's going on in this situation. We understand that rough times are coming. You get some liberty, enjoy it. You get some peace, some times of peace, enjoy it, okay? Things are going to get uh, rougher for sure. It's 1 Thessalonians, same thing. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in the darkness of that day should overtake you as a thief. Then they remind you that the Amalekites, right? All of the, the spoils are spread out and they're saying, peace, peace. Look, we won the battle, right? You say peace, peace, but sudden destruction's coming, right? And so we understand as Christians, look, 
I'm going to enjoy my peace while I have it. I'm going to enjoy my prosperity while I have it. I'm going to enjoy all these things that God allows me to have, but it's with the understanding that, look, the war's not over yet. I may have won one battle, but the next battle is just around the head, and the war's not over. I'm going to keep on fighting. And so let's get back into the, uh, the idea of the context of that text in Luke, uh, in Luke 14, and that is discipleship discipleship so let me just throw out in this I'm conc- this is a conclusion here let me throw out a few more uh, scenarios okay spiritually speaking in the all right remember what kingdom we're part of not a, no, we're not the United States kingdom or not the uh, the world kingdom the USA you know, I mean uh, what a, the uh, whatever the the world <laughs> We're not part of this world, am I right? Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love the things of this world, the love of the Father is not in him, right? And so, uh, so we understand we're not of this world, but uh, let's think spiritually for a second. Don't quit studying and memorizing Scripture because you won a few battles at the door. Isn't it exciting when you get done knocking on a door and you're like, man, all the verses just came to me. And I was able to, to just, you know, tell that person the truths of the gospel. And maybe they even threw something about baptism and boom, the scriptures came to you. And, uh, and man, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you this from experience for sure. It doesn't matter how many verses you memorize. If you're not using them regularly, man, you're going you're gonna to forget them. You're going to, where was that again? I remember studying that one time. Maybe I just because I'm getting older or something, but I forget things all the time. Look, keep on studying. Keep being in the world or in the word. The Holy Spirit can use whatever you ha- were just studying. It happens all the time. Just studying that. I was just trying to memorize that scripture or whatever. The Holy Spirit will bring it to your mind at the right time. And you'll be able to use that in an upcoming battle that you don't even know about. Okay. And so don't just quit. Say, hey, I had that victory. Hey, I got through. Uh, young kids might be like, hey, I got through patch class. And I, uh, I memorized all the scriptures that I was supposed to memorize. No, 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 don't quit there. It's a lifelong, you know, uh, 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 practice of strengthening yourself, equipping yourself for battle. In your Bible. Don't quit praying and seeking God, even though all the things in your life seem to be going well. I mean, that's something you can learn from the life of David. Whenever uh, things are going, uh, just anybody in general is like this, but you can see it in life of David. Things are going well. It seems like he's not as quick to just seek the Lord about things. That makes sense. But man, things in your life get rough and you're just crying. You're just coming before God. You're asking everybody to pray for you. Hey, you know, I just can't handle this. Will you please pray for me? My life's falling apart or something like that. Look, don't make that the only times that you go to the Lord and seek his will. Don't make that the only times that you pray. Look, just because everything is going real smooth right now doesn't mean you're okay. You know, this is why when you knock on uh, neighborhoods that are a little wealthier, they're always like, hey, I'm good. I'm good. I got everything that I need. Take away all the uh, all their prosperity, and then they're just going to be like, you know, I don't know what to do. Somebody needs to help me, you know. <laughs> I remember, uh, again, uh, you probably experienced this yourself, but I remember at work many times. The people that didn't want anything to do with you, they didn't want to hang out with you because you were the weirdo that was always reading your Bible at lunchtime and, and uh, giving them gospel tracts and trying to preach to them and all that kind of stuff. They didn't want anything to do with you. But, you know, as soon as they're going through some problem in their life, you know, oh, my wife left me or, or uh, hey, my son is, it got mixed up in this kind of lifestyle or whatever. It's funny how they come find you almost in private, like Nicodemus coming to Jesus at night, you know, almost in private where no one can see him. And they're like, hey, what would you do about this and this and this? <laughs> right? Because when people lose everything and things get taken away from them, then they say, I can't rely on myself. I have to turn to the Lord. Okay, so don't ever quit seeking God just because things seem to be going well. <clears throat> if this work, KC Mission, Alabama Temple, whatever you want to call it, if it starts growing to the point where, man, it's just, you know, there's just plenty of people, everything's running smoothly, everybody's in the right place, it's like self-sufficient, it's just, it just takes care of, I mean, just everything is running smooth, right? 
that doesn't mean we should ever let up on soul winning. Ever let up on the things that we're doing right now. Ever let up on, hey, other people are doing it now. Let me back off a little bit. No, no, no. We need to pick it up. We just keep picking it up. Keep setting the example. Keep fighting new battles, right? Uh, maybe there's some other battle to be fought somewhere else, but we don't ever want to quit doing what we're doing. In fact, I was thinking about this. I came across this verse, and it just stood out to me in the in the the phrase field work came out. Okay, never quit doing the field work. Look at Proverbs chapter twenty four. Proverbs chapter twenty four. Can you imagine if I was a farmer and I started building my barn and I said, man, I, I better make sure it's a really big barn, right? Because I'm going to have a huge harvest. And I just started building that thing, made it all nice, painted it real nice and pretty, made sure everything was just fancy and all that. But I never actually went out and planted seeds <laughs> and watered and tilled the ground and did all the hard work out in the field. What would be the point of the barn, right? <laughs> it would just be lost. And uh, here's what the Bible says, Proverbs 24, 27. Prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. Let me read it again. Prepare thy work without, and make it fit for thyself in the field, and afterwards build thine house. Now, I'm sure there's other applications you can draw out of that, but what my mind went to is just the fact that, hey, you need to go do the labor that needs to be done. You see what I'm saying? You need to go there and put hard work in the field because the big house is, is pointless you know, without, you know, without actually making. And so it's kind of like your job. You know? if, if, if everybody's just making their office look pretty, and they're hanging the pictures, and they're making their office space look real nice, and and but they never actually do whatever it is that business is is doing, you know, whatever they're supposed to be producing. If they're not producing that, they're just oh, we just need to get ready. We just need to build this. And I'm going to tell you this: that a lot of Christians think of church like, man, we got to have a nice building, we got to really put a lot into it, have all the fancy programs and systems in place and and i just got like three calls three calls this week hey brother i'm going to start a church in such and such kansas such and such place kansas and I, I just wondered if we can come by and present our ministry and uh and talk to you about it and, and they're trying to raise support and i'm not saying all those guys are wicked or anything like that i'm just saying they're trying to raise support because here's the typical idea i need to keep raising support uh, and, and, and get the money until I know that I'm taken care of. You know, I know I got all the, uh, this, all the money's coming in so that I can quit what I'm doing. I can go over to this place and I can begin to put in the work. But then you know what the work is? We need to get a building. Next thing you know, you got letters coming saying, hey, would you pray about supporting this work? We got this new building. All we need is X amount of money. And if you can help us, that would be great. And then they spend all their time raising money for this building. And I'm not saying they're not doing anything out there trying to bring people to the building, but it's like the whole focus is on the building. Once people do start filling up in there, maybe they got some few people coming, then they're like, huh, how can we get more people coming? We need to start this program. We need to start a school. We need to start these things. And it's all about building up the organization and building up the building and all that. But no, we, we understand our philosophy here at this church is that we go out into the field. And we go out into the field. We do the field work. Now, hopefully then we see uh, results. We win some battles, right? And then we bring them in. But look, never give up. Never stop uh, doing that work and feel like, ah, everything is going good. We're seeing results. We're seeing success. And then, uh, and, and then give up what it's close to do. Remember that the spiritual warfare, it's, I mean, it's continual. It's a war until the day that Jesus rules and reigns on this earth. And, uh, uh, and, and, in and during that time, it's going to be a series of battles. You're going to win some, you're going to lose some, but you got to just keep on getting up, going back to the war and, uh, and fighting all over again. So in times of peace, prepare for war. Let's pray. Father, thank you.
for your word. I thank you for this work. I thank you for our, uh, the, the lives of everybody here, just individually and things that might be going on. I pray that you help us to uh, to prosper as you seem as you see fit, and to enjoy the prosperity when we have it. We certainly want liberties, particularly liberties that would allow us to preach the gospel. We wouldn't have that taken away. Liberties that we could raise our children uh, the the godly way and not have to worry about fighting the government on that. Certain liberties we we certainly want. But Father, I pray that you will. Uh, Help us to serve you and fight the battle and be prepared for the battle no matter what we go through. And even when times are peaceful and we seem to have all of our liberties in place, Lord, help us not lose sight of the fact that there's another battle coming around the corner. And help us to prepare for that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.